Yo, what's going on Dragon Ballers? Welcome back to another video. This time we're talking about something that's a bit of a touchy, touchy subject. This is going to talk about how your mentality is holding you back in the Dragon Ball Super card game. Now this is not a your bad video. This is so much more than that. Uh, I think that's kind of a, a very shallow approach to this. This is actually something I think I can help you guys with in a way where I think that if you guys can kind of open your mind up a bit and view the game in a different manner, I think it's actually gonna benefit you in the long run. Now, not everyone thinks in these ways, not everyone falls to these, these tendencies, but I do see this a lot out there. And I think it's just a good general video to put out there just to help people kind of think about the game in a different way. Because I, I really think this is something that kind of separates the, the regular players from the great players. You know, there's a lot of names out there you see all the time. And I think they view the game in this way. And I think it also helps benefit them. And I think it helped benefit you too. So we're gonna talk about it in, the, in today's video. If you guys are new here, Make sure to subscribe, hit that bell so you never miss a video. If you guys want to help support the channel, tons of ways you can do that. If you want to buy any cards, make sure you use my link down below to either TCG Player or Beer Collectibles. You can check out the Patreon, lots of competitive articles. This is a lot of the stuff I talk about in the Patreon as well. So if you feel like you need more help with this, you're probably going to want to check that out. And guys, we have the Crossbow TCG merch store down below. All that stuff really goes a long way. It helps me keep bringing you guys this content. And finally, guys. We want to see you with the Dale Mac Tournament of Power. I believe in my team. I believe in this tournament. We're going to make it the biggest tournament of the year. And these tips and tricks I'm going to help you guys with today, they're going to bring you guys pretty far in that tournament. I believe in what I'm about to tell you guys right now. But that being said, we're going to hop right into it. So one of the things I've been hearing a lot lately is power creep in Dragon Ball Super is becoming too much. It's becoming overbearing. And when I see these comments, when I see people say these things, I, I, I can't believe it. It's very very weird you know I, I know these people probably aren't the most competitive players in the game that are saying these things but just look at the top cuts you know I've been covering just about I want to say every single event probably for the past you know year maybe two years you know, I don't have an exact number but I see the trends guys the trends say that these old leaders up on the screen right now are still topping Broly VR man this guy has probably has the most wins out of any leader in the game I would probably I'd be willing to bet money on that that yellow Broly has the most wins out of any leader in this game. And obviously he just got errated. So his big errata says, instead of untapping any battle card or any card in general, you can only untap Broly BRs. I'm also willing to bet that this leader is still going to top events, perhaps win an event or two. I think he's still got a very strong green yellow shell. And obviously his leader has been topping since what? Since over a year ago. I think is when he came out, probably over a year ago at this point, maybe a year and a half ago, this guy is still topping events. So that just goes to show that that leader is still very powerful. Janemba, one of the leaders that we can't get to go away, guys. This guy has been relevant for what? Since set five. So if you count side sets, I'll say five sets now he's been relevant. So that's just another, another example. Shenron, another example from the same era, set five. And we've seen a lot of different builds of Shenron. Now, the thing with these leaders is, of course, there are new cards that come out and they do help out these decks that is i guess a way you can say power creep but you guys have to look at it in this way if bandai doesn't sell new sets and if bandai doesn't promote their new cards how is the game going to stay alive so i think you need to look at it in in a, in a way like that but then you also have to look at it and and say this when i wrote my deck list for the chicago regional i looked at sensu bean i looked at furling touch and champa and I said, wow, these cards are still relevant from set one. That was what, almost three years ago. And it's so funny to me how those cards are still super relevant. I was actually talking to uh, Peter Katani and I said, dude, what if they power creep further instruction Champa, gave us like a, a two energy combo, gave it triple strike. That would be uh, that'd be kind of crazy. But that's what I was pretty much talking about. Those cards are still very, very relevant. You have the staple sparking negates that have been relevant since set five. So I wouldn't really say power creep is too insane. Next up, if you look at Golden Frieza, this is a set one leader that actually resurged into the game. This leader didn't do a whole lot since set two when it was actually winning here and there. But now there's actually a whole Facebook group dedicated to this archetype and this leader. This leader is what started it all. Just like what, one or two or three events ago, this leader started really making its presence known in top cuts. And then if you look at Pan, this leader has been topping consistently since set three. I think the past two tournaments or maybe past three tournaments are the only events that it missed, but it topped this past nationals and it's been around for two nationals so far. So again, there are new main deck cards that come out and help these decks. But again, guys, that's kind of the model that 
Bandai is going to have to follow if they're going to stay afloat. So I really don't think it's fair to say Power Creep is ruining the game or killing the game. I don't think that's I don't think it's a fair way to off put how you might not be seeing success in the game. I think instead you should kind of open your mind to the fact that you can grow as a player. And that's what my channel is here for. That's what all the other channels on YouTube are here for. The Patreons, the pillars of the community that don't have, you know, content creation outlets. But a lot of us are here to help you guys do that. I think that's a, I think that'd be a very smart way to consider opening your mind. But I do have more points to help you guys. You know, I'm not just trying to tell you guys to, you know, stop being dumb. What I am trying to tell you guys is there are ways you can learn from your mistakes. So one of the things I actually talk about with my friends a lot, <clears throat> the game is too RNG based. Okay, preface, it's a trading card game. RNG is 100% going to be a part of it. And I actually wrote an article about this uh, a few weeks ago. There are going to be some games you lose and it's going to be out of your control. You didn't draw the out. You didn't um, you didn't see what you needed to see. And those are going to happen. And I really advise you guys to not get angry about those losses, <clears throat> not get salty about those losses. That's what I try and do is, you know, when that happens to me, I kind of just chalk it up to it wasn't in the cards. There's another outlet to that that I'll talk about in just a little bit. But that's one of the ways I, I try and uh, I try and cope with those losses. But I want to tell a mini story about why I think people have a poor outlook on RNG in this game. First of all, this game, you draw more cards than any other card game on the market. So RNG is definitely minimized in the Dragon Ball Super card game. But <clears throat> I had two friends playing uh, probably a few months ago at this point. One of my friends was playing a Bobbity deck. Just, you know, get six energy, drop Bobbity, then drop Kaioken, things like that. My other friend was playing Raditz. So... My Bobbity friend was complaining because the game went very long, like turn seven, eight, nine, something like that. And he did not see a Bobbity to drop on his opponent. Now it's the boss monster of your deck. You imagine you're running, you know, three to four copies of it and you want to see it by turn six. He was complaining about not seeing it. The Raditz player ended up taking it, taking it home. That's what it was. And, and the Bobbity player was not very happy. The problem was the Bobbity player decided to play three copies in his main deck where uh, you know of his boss monster the other problem was he charged one on turn one and the other problem was that he decided to warp one early game for the raditz effect so if you guys look at it there he only ran three copies which i don't necessarily disagree with but he could have ran four of his boss monster he, he needed to charge one turn one which again you can't disagree with because if you see it way too early you're going to charge one and you're going to hope to see another copy later on. But then he decided to warp one from his hand, uh, you know, during the mid game, I guess a few turns before he could drop Bobbity. Now, that is a problem in, in thought process, in my opinion, because you made the choices to charge, you made the choices to warp, and then you were relying to see that one last copy in your deck. So in my opinion, he could have saved one of those Bobbities. I probably would have said charge the one turn one because that's really early to see Bobbity. And then you just need to hold it and not warp it from your hand with Raditz. So there are just play line decisions like that where a lot of times people will chalk it up to RNG when really it was actually player choice that kind of led you down that path to losing. Another thing I wanna talk about, RNG. People oftentimes complain about matchups and like, you know, when the format is too diverse, we've had very diverse formats ever since Super Shenron has been uh, removed from the metagame. So a lot of people like to complain and say, oh, the format is too diverse. Therefore, if I play X deck and I run into my bad matchup, I'm going to automatically lose. Now, another preface, I can't 100% disagree with that because there are matchups that are very, very hard to win. For example, if you're playing Universe 6, you're playing like Blue Yellow U6 that relies on Chompa Vados, and you run into a red matchup, it's very, very difficult to win that matchup. It's, it's very, very true because Vegeta Exploding Weakness, it answers your entire board. You don't have a way to interact with Vegeta Exploding Weakness as a yellow leader. And that's very difficult. I 100% I sympathize with that. But that's not the case for, I would say, most bad matchups in this game. Both Most bad matchups in the current format, I would say, are very far from auto loss. And the sideboard has very much evolved in a way that allows you to deal with that. I remember back in like the set two days where the PPG guys would side deck one of each Ginyu Force character. And it was just for flavor. But nowadays, the sideboard's actually evolved to where you can actually sideboard a lot of options to help you beat those bad matchups. One of the things I want to talk about as an example for this is actually Super Shenron format. So back then it was a little bit divisive in the sense that people weren't sure if it was tier zero or not. A lot of people said it wasn't tier zero and that Green Broly BR was a poor matchup for the deck. And that was kind of true because Green Broly BR could be very aggressive towards Super Shenron. 
and green broly br inherently answered height of mastery which is one of their main win conditions but come the arg springfield event super shenron players figured out their bad matchup and that's one of the points of advice i want to give you guys put time into figuring out your bad matchups don't just scrap a deck because it can't beat a certain deck because one you're not always going to play that deck in the tournament unless it is tier zero uh, status and two there's probably a strategy you can figure out to help you beat your bad matchups now don't get me wrong i've put decks aside this format because it seems it's too difficult to play them like i don't really want to touch blue decks because tn but thankfully tn is getting banned so i can kind of revisit that but anyways super shenron found bardock fully unleashed and you would think that was crazy like uh, it's really difficult for shenron leaders to want to overwhelm because they need their Dragon Balls in the drop area to resolve their leader's ultimate effect. But you just do that first, you play the Bardock Overrealm, you kill any Broly's your opponent has, and you kill them from there pretty easy. So Super Shenron is able to find that. I think that a lot of decks this format are able to find answers to their bad matchups. It just takes a little bit of research, a little bit of help, and don't be afraid to ask for help, guys. If you have a player at your locals who you, think, who you know is kind of a better player, I would not hesitate to ask that player for advice you know that's one of the other things one of the other big pieces of advice i would give you guys don't be too stubborn in this game there are so many people that don't want to share deck lists don't want to get feedback they're a little bit too prideful i would strongly strongly recommend you uh, you put your pride aside and seek out help when you're deck building but anyways one last thing i want to talk about today guys um there's that mentality where it's like oh i should have won this is bs uh there was it was all chalked up to rng kind of the same thing we we're talking about but a lot of times when you do lose the game you know I, like i said there are those rng times you can't do anything about but there are going to be instances in which you could have done something better i i just went back and watched my stream games from chicago and in that top four game that i lost that was that was the big one that mattered it prevented me from going to the finals there were some plays i could have made differently there were some different decisions i could have made and it may have led to a different outcome uh, I, I i especially think that if i would have sideboarded differently i would have had a better shot so i definitely think that when you do lose games you know there are things to consider maybe it wasn't your play lines maybe it was your deck construction one of the big things i missed from chicago was a certain side deck card that i wish i had so if i would have had that on my sideboard i think would have had a better shot ratios of cards like i talked about the bobby example if you would have played four bobbies he would have had a much better shot of seeing his win condition so these are things i kind of want you guys just to wrap your head around i think they would help you in the long run as a dragon ball super card game player as a card game player in general I really think that these kind of uh, ways to open your mind and mold your mind, I think will help a lot. But guys, I know this is like kind of a weird video, kind of controversial. Let me in the comments below what you think. Uh, was this video worth making? What'd you guys get out of it? Let me know. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. I'll see you next time.